five things that happened after Jesus died. Number one, there was an earthquake. Following the death of Jesus, there was a response from creation. We read that the earth shook and the rock split. Nature itself was shaken by the death of the Son of God. Matthew states first that the earth trembled and the rock split. This language implies that this is a significant earthly reaction to the divine events on the cross. Number two, the tombs opened. Matthew then records an incident found in none of the other gospels. The tombs were opened and many bodies of the saints, God's people who had fallen asleep in death, were raised. After their resurrection, they came out of the tombs, entered the holy city Jerusalem and appeared to many. Earthquakes can damage tombs as they were carved in stone. The resurrection of the bodies can only be attributed to the direct action of God, implying he is behind the earthquake. Given the geological features of Palestine, which lies on a significant seismic fault, an earthquake would not be an unusual event. But combined with rocks leading to the opening of tombs, it is another significant testament to Jesus' crucifixion. Another earthquake will soon witness an even more significant divine event, the resurrection of Jesus. Matthew's unique record of these events emphasizes the victory over death that Jesus' sacrifice on the cross accomplishes. Those who were resurrected are literally described as those who had fallen asleep, a common New Testament idiom for someone who has died but whose eternal fate is secure. Like the initial testimony, the supernatural resurrection of these saints' bodies and their appearances in Jerusalem is a striking witness to Jesus' work on the cross and subsequently to his resurrection. The term holy people likely refers to pious figures from the Old Testament, heroes, and martyrs of Israel's history selected to miraculously witness these events. Their appearance to people in Jerusalem is a testimony to the effectiveness of Jesus' work on the cross. This anticipates Paul's teaching about Jesus being the first fruits of the dead, but now as things really are, Christ indeed rose from the dead and became the first fruits, that is, the first to be resurrected with an incorruptible, immortal body anticipating the resurrection of those who have fallen asleep in death. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive, but each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then those who are Christ's at his coming will be resurrected with incorruptible, immortal bodies. The resurrection of these saints is a prelude to the resurrection all believers can look forward to through Jesus' death. A new day has come, a day when death was defeated by death, and the resurrection to eternal life became possible. But note, it was not until after Jesus' resurrection that the occupants of these tombs were raised and entered Jerusalem, where they appeared to many. The Bible does not say whether these resurrected saints died again or went to heaven with the Lord Jesus. The death of the Son of God shook nature itself. The popular preacher Charles Spurgeon stated that men's hearts did not respond to the dying Redeemer's agonizing cries but the rocks responded. The rocks were split. He did not die for the rocks, yet the rocks were more sensitive than the hearts of men for whom he shed his blood. It is best understood that Matthew intended us to see that the earthquake occurred on the day Jesus was crucified, and then on the day he was revealed as risen. The power of new life was so strong that it brought back some of the good people who had died. This is one of the strangest passages in Matthew's Gospel. Matthew does not provide us with much information, and we do not learn about this occurrence from any other source. Number three, the veil of the temple was torn in two, and Jesus cried out again with a loud and agonizing voice and voluntarily surrendered his spirit, sovereignly dismissing and releasing his spirit from his body in submission to his father's plan. And at once, the veil of the Holy of Holies in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. The curtain that covered the temple was torn in two places, the curtain was the only thing in the temple that differentiated the sacred area from the most holy part of the temple. It was a very clear illustration of the separation between God and man. Acts 6, 7 says that in the days of the early church, many of the priests were obedient to the faith. Perhaps this torn veil demonstrated to them the greatness of Jesus' work. It is also probably how the torn veil became common knowledge. Hebrews 9, 1, 9 tells us that in the temple, a veil separated the Holy of Holies, the earthly place of God's presence from the rest of the temple where men dwell. Indeed, the first covenant had regulations for divine worship and for the earthly sanctuary. A sacred tent was set up, the outer or first section in which were the lampstand and the table with its consecrated bread. This is called the holy place. Behind the second veil was another tabernacle, the inner or second section known as the Holy of Holies. 
The book of Exodus teaches that this thick veil was made of blue, purple, scarlet material and twisted linen. Now Christ is our superior high priest, and as believers in his finished work, we partake in his superior priesthood. We can now enter the Holy of Holies through him. Hebrews 10, 19, 20 says, We have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the veil, that is his body. As we look upon this scene, we see an image of Jesus' flesh being torn for us, just as he was tearing the veil for us. The book of Hebrews provides a gloriously detailed explanation of the profound meaning associated with the tearing of the veil. The veil that always hung in the temple served as a constant reminder that sin makes humans unworthy of being in God's presence. The fact that the sin offering was presented once a year beyond the myriad of other sacrifices that were presented daily was a blatant illustration of the reality that sin really could not be atoned for or eradicated by mere animal sacrifices. Because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross, the barriers that used to separate God and people were destroyed, and now we can approach God with confidence and boldness. Hebrews 4.14, 6 says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold firmly to our confession of faith. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. Yet he did not sin. Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Jesus' body was torn and so was the veil, each signifying that now we can boldly approach God. We have a high priest presiding over the heavenly courts to ensure that the believer has full access. At the moment Christ died, the heavy woven curtain separating the two main rooms of the temple was torn by an invisible hand from top to bottom. The death of the Son of God was also accompanied by massive tremors in the natural world, as if there were some kind of emotional connection between the inanimate creation and the one who made it. Number 4. There was darkness over the whole land. Now from the sixth hour noon, there was darkness over the entire land until the ninth hour. There was a thick darkness over the whole land. Now the scripture was fulfilled. Amos 8, 8, 9. And it shall come to pass in that day, says the Lord God, that I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. Often Christ was asked for a sign from heaven, and now they had one, but such that it signified the blindness of their eyes. At this point in the afternoon it would be noon, and the darkness would continue until the ninth hour, which would be three o'clock. This supernatural darkness appeared when the sun was at its brightest because the moon was full. It could not have been created by an eclipse as it cannot interpose between the earth and the sun when it is full. God's swift intervention not only brought about this darkness, astronomical knowledge was rudimentary at the time. Phlegon also mentions an earthquake which aligns his story closely with the sacred record. The creature could not sully the error before its creator. Therefore, the sun withdrew its rays so as not to witness the acts of the wicked. The darkness occurring at such a critical moment can mean several things. First, darkness was associated in antiquity with mourning. Darkness was also associated with the death of great men. Both Gentile and Jewish readers could understand the darkness as a cosmic sign accompanying the death of a king. Moreover, darkness was a sign of God's judgment. The tombs were opened, and many bodies of the saints, God's people who had fallen asleep in death, were raised and coming out of the tombs. After their resurrection, they entered the holy city Jerusalem and appeared to many. Matthew 27, 52, 53. Number 5. The soldier overseeing the execution realized he was innocent. Now the centurion and those with him guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that were happening, became terribly frightened and filled with awe, said, Truly, this was the Son of God. Matthew 27, 53, 54. It was the job of a centurion to ensure the crucifixion was carried out correctly and without complications. He was generally in charge of a hundred soldiers. At the time of a crucifixion, he was a career soldier whose courage and intelligence helped him rise through the ranks. He would be a soldier of the highest order. He would need to be both cold and efficient to succeed in this position. This man had to follow the orders of his superiors. The scene at Jesus' crucifixion was so remarkable that even a hardened Roman centurion recognized that this was the Son of God. This realization meant that Jesus was innocent of the crime for which he was on the cross. The centurion must have had a mix of emotions. He had just realized that he had overseen the crucifixion of an innocent man. These were not the whispered words of a scared recruit. 
or the trembling words of an easily manipulated conscript. They were the conclusions reached by a seasoned veteran, a man who had watched countless men suffer horrific ends and was responsible for leading them to death. This centurion was well aware of the strong condemnation of the Jewish religious leaders who put Jesus on the cross for blasphemy. His commander-in-chief, Pontius Pilate, had upheld Jesus' condemnation for making this claim. But he rejects the condemnation and declares Jesus' claim. Why? Because the arguments in favor of Christ were overwhelming. Although he undoubtedly had overseen many crucifixions, this execution was different. What did he see? Various scenes from the events of Jesus' arrest, trial, and crucifixion combined into a compelling statement. It might have been Jesus' response to the injustice he was forced to endure at the hands of his own countrymen through arrest and trials. It could have been Jesus' response to the torture he suffered at the hands of the centurion and his men. One could think of the dignity with which Jesus responded to the lynch mob demanding his blood. Like a silent sheep before its slaughter, the scripture does not record any response from Jesus to the crowd's cries. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him release Barabbas for them instead. Pilate answered again, Then what shall I do with the one you call the king of the Jews? They shouted back, Crucify him. But Pilate asks, Why? What evil has he done? Yet they shouted all the more, Crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas for them, and after having Jesus whipped, handed him over to his soldiers to be crucified. His concern was for their forgiveness, not for his escape. Jesus' mercy towards the people who rejected him and the soldiers who crucified him, including this centurion, his response, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Luke 23, 34. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots, dividing his garments among themselves. And the people stood by watching. But even the rulers scoffed and mocked him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed of God, the Chosen One. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him vinegar, and saying sarcastically, If you are really the king of the Jews, save yourself. Now there was also an inscription above him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. As they gambled for Jesus' belongings, Jesus' concern was for their forgiveness, not his escape. What a powerful statement. Matthew chapter 27, 35-36 and when they crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. Then sitting down there, they began to keep watch over him to guard against any attempt at rescue. If all this did not convince him, he saw something more. The response of creation. Clearly, the centurion was shocked to witness such a dramatic event during Christ's final hours, especially since he had never seen anything like it before. It had an almost immeasurable impact on him. The centurion saw heard and felt all the events of Christ's crucifixion and death. As a result, he and his troops were greatly frightened. Even if the centurion and his group of soldiers had learned to deal with fear, now they were experiencing pure terror. It's this powerful cross and the love demonstrated there that moves hearts, even the hardened, battle-weary heart of a career soldier. From death to life, an old saying goes, the ground is always level at the foot of the cross. It was so in the first century and it is still today. The foot of the cross is where everyone, poor and rich, finds level ground to kneel and embrace the Christ who died for them. Truly, this is the Son of God. We hear and believe. The journey must not end there. We should have a passion to know Him more deeply. May that same desire burn in our hearts so we can honestly know the One who loved us and gave Himself for us. One cannot help but wonder how the encounter with Jesus affected the lives of the soldiers. Did they become Christians? The pulpit commentary reports the tradition that the centurion's name was Longinus and that he became a devout follower of Jesus, preached the gospel, and died as a martyr. This is only tradition. We do not know if this happened, but we do know that truth has a way of clinging to a person's heart. The cross of Jesus has the power to change the individual. The centurion started as a Roman officer overseeing a crucifixion, but ended the day recognizing that Jesus was the Son of God. Jesus has already taken the initiative in salvation. Christ died for you. Now it's your turn. Jesus gave his life so that we could have ours back. He died as us so we could live as him. He not only pleased his father, but won us as a prize. As humanity's substitute, Jesus suffered the withdrawal of communion from the father. 
terrible as this was, it fulfilled God's good and loving plan of redemption. There are others who consider this a myth, or at best, a theological story. These are all unique events that uniformly testify to God's unique acts in human history. They are extraordinary supernatural testimonies that confirm the truth of the gospel and the transformative reality of Christ's love. If this content was valuable to you, I ask that you support me with your subscription so you don't miss any of our upcoming videos. Together, we can enlighten more minds and expand our understanding. Thank you for being here, and may God bless you. All from Bible Stories, Forgiveness Blessings, Watched.